want to start off with a little plug this time, a little short plug. How many of you made it to Wednesday night testimony service on Wednesday night? So, I had to work late, and I missed it. But if you'll go to Beaver Creek Baptist Church, Org, you can watch that service. It's downloaded right now. Today's service will be downloaded by tomorrow. And it's easy to catch up with the Revelation series that Pastor Steve is teaching. As well, it's easy to catch up on that testimony service that was last Wednesday night. I challenge you, I challenge you to make that a part of your day this next week somewhere. Look up UCreekBaptistChurch.org and look at last Wednesday's night's last Wednesday night's service where Tom Carlisle and several others shared their testimony and you will be totally blessed. Totally. Tom and his wife came to church here for years and Tom has cancer or had cancer and has had to deal with that and his testimony is so awesome. And so if you'll go to BeecreekBaptistChurch.org, you'll be able to get caught up on anything that you missed Wednesday night or last Sunday as we'll be continuing this morning the Revelation series. So let's uh, kick off the fun this morning with a hearty hallelujah on the count of three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. And then stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I shall not be moved is in your praise book. Your little brown praise book. I shall not be moved. Page number 35.
up going, woo! Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know what vitamins he takes, but I want some. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, what a beautiful day we've got going here. And we're going to sing some songs, and, and uh, we're, we're just going to have a time worshiping the Lord this morning and glorifying Him. So, Father in heaven, we do pray that you will be indeed glorified through Jesus Christ this morning. We thank you so much for allowing us to be here and just for your great salvation. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your precious life, your horrific death on the cross, your resurrection, ascension, and your intercession for each one of us. And we'll give all of the glory to God through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we've got some announcements when uh, uh, we've got the spaghetti feed coming up. Yes, yes. It's a party. And I have a lot of people coming to the party, so please join us September 9th, 29th, September 29th, yeah, <laughs> September 29th, that's Friday, 6 o'clock, please come, it's a spaghetti feed, all you can eat, in your brochure, there is a flyer, put it on your fridge, come see Carmen York, or me, to buy your ticket. And then the funnest part, or the most funnest, is the bad English. So the most fun is if you bring your dessert, we'll auction it off, and uh, then we get to eat that. And so please come, that helps with the scholarship uh, fundraiser, and it's the biggest party of the year. But please don't miss it. And there'll be door prizes. And Lenore makes the best spaghetti. And Lenore makes the best spaghetti in town. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, that's awesome. Hey, we want to invite you to Wednesday evening where we will also feed you uh, physically and spiritually. Uh, potluck is at 6, Bible study is at 6.45, and this Wednesday evening the church will be supplying tacos. Yes, tacos. Tacos. So, yeah, bring your Spanish friends and we'll uh, all have tacos. Women's Bible study is on September 16th at 10, and you can call Linda, her number's in there. Uh, the Men's Bible study is on Tuesday morning, and that's at 10 also, and that's Pastor P.K. is teaching the Gospel of Matthew. And there's always um, some food, music, and fun, so, well, uh, yeah. Uh, prayer requests, you can call Flo Downing uh, and our Hebrew here, our, our scriptures, Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who is he who promised is faithful um, the rest of it you can read in your um, bulletin and we'll continue on okay I just said the rest you can read in your bulletin okay since, since we have the, uh, would you like to talk about the issues? Yes. yes. Okay. I have found some of my homemade black bird shirt before, and everyone has loved it. I will be bringing some of it to the social. I will be bringing a big cake because it's Jeff's birthday on Friday, and we'll celebrate Saturday. I will be putting four of the uh, spaghetti feet. I will be putting a couple of those nice jars of black bird shirt. So come, taste. Uh, you guys can get on on the 29th. Blackberry syrup. And that's for men and women, um, anybody can come? And that's on Saturday at 1 to 3. Mm, ice cream social. That sounds you can read that. Read. You can read it in your bulletin. Isn't <laughs> 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 it great to be a part of a loving church family? Yes. Let's have a little talk with Jesus in the praise book number 30. Amen. Just a little talk with Jesus in the praise book number three.
and you'll find sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. We're just going to lift this up to the, to the Lord this morning. Uh, go ahead and stand in celebration of Him if you're able. And uh, let's just sing this out. Just praise His name this morning. Sweet hour of prayer.
house. I'm sure that these songs we're singing will be sung in heaven, Lord, and, and at least I hope so anyway. Father, it's, it's something to look forward to the hope of heaven and to know that um, it's going to be a new life, a completely different life. There won't be any sin or evil. There won't be any sickness or death. Oh God, that just would be something that would be wonderful to look forward to. And Lord, we just pray that, Father, you would uh, be blessed and that we would bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Father in heaven, we do end up holding all these folks to you up in prayer, Lord. And Lord, you know what each one of us needs to worship you and to be happy in this life. We just pray that, Father, you'd bless each one, that you'd bless little Nessa with her hand and heal it, Lord, soon, that you'd give uh, Jimmy a completely uh, successful operation, Lord, that, uh, that he can... Uh, have a, a good life until the rapture. And Father, we just pray that the rest of the people that uh, raised their hands and those that didn't, Lord, we know that we all have needs, Father, and things that we want to bring before you. So Lord, I give this minute of silent prayer to you, Lord. Father, we just pray that you'll bless this offering, that it might be used for your glory in this community. And thank you for everyone who, uh, who participates in it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Isn't that music nice? Yes. It's awesome, huh? Before we get started, I do want to say something more about the Ice Cream Social. They actually got more press than anybody now. Um, <laughs> and that is that uh, that's, that's being put on by the quilters. And if you've never seen what the quilters do, they have a ministry and they make these beautiful quilts and uh, then they auction them off. There, there is a card that came from the Pregnancy Center. The quilters need to make sure you see it out on the bulletin board for all the quilts that you gave them. So yeah, and they, they make quilts for the Pregnancy Center and help the, the ladies. And it's just, it's a great ministry. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word. We do pray that you'll bless it, that you'll grant us wisdom and discretion, understanding and knowledge as we study it. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us. We confess to you, Lord God, that we're sinners saved by your grace. And we thank you so much for your great plan of salvation. Father, please bless your word today to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, turn to Revelation uh, chapter 1. And um, we'll start there. And we're going to... We're going to segue off into a couple other scriptures that you'll find very interesting that go along right along with this book. Revelation is kind of a hard book to understand. And uh, most people just don't understand it because they don't read it or they haven't been taught it. But the one thing I can tell you about this book is that it is for the most part understandable. One of the um, one of the the situations with interpreting scripture is that scripture interprets scripture. Okay, so when we look at the book of Revelation, all right, we see that these strange um, things that we that we read about have probably been mentioned somewhere else in the Bible. And so what helps us to understand it is to go back and we the first thing we do is it's the law of first mention. So when you read about something in the Bible and you don't understand it, you go back to where it was first mentioned in the Bible and then you, uh, you'll get a better understanding of it. So the book of Revelation, chapter 1, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ as given to John, the Apostle. And John the Apostle is the same person that wrote the Gospel of John and the same person that wrote the three letters to John, uh, John uh, right before Revelation. So let me start with reading Revelation chapter 1, starting verse 1. Now listen, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And, you know, this was written some 2,000 years ago, but it's just as relevant today as it was back then, in fact, maybe even more so. One thing about this book is that there are many dual prophecies, as there are in other places in the Bible. God is so smart that he can say one sentence and it can apply to two different points in time, or two different eras, or two different uh, groups of people. And when John was writing this, the Christians were being persecuted terribly. And uh, so uh, some of this was written in like code so that he wouldn't get in trouble with Domitian or whoever the emperor was then because the persecution of Christians here were, was just terrible. They were, they were being taken, arrested, and many killed. So uh, when we come to those points, I'll let you know. It says here in verse 2, He made it known, okay? Jesus made it known by sending His angel to His servant John, who testifies to everything He saw. So this is eyewitness testimony that we have of Jesus Christ. The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We read in Revelation 19.9 last week that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. 
All right? So, Jesus Christ was not only the greatest prophet that ever lived, but he was also, his words were prophetic in their uh, meaning. Now this is a wonderful, verse 3, this is a wonderful promise, and it's the only promise like it given in the Bible. It's a blessing. It says, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Okay, so that's me right now. It says, blessed are those who hear it. That's you right now. And take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And if the time was near 2,000 years ago, it's really near now. All right? So let's just uh, take off from there and turn over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, okay? Because uh, this uh, first chapter is just an amazing expose of Jesus Christ. So, you know, people, people say, well, you know, the book of Revelation is about the future. Yes, there is future mentioned in it. There is past mentioned in it. But the book of Revelation is the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ. Now the Gospels were the revealing of Jesus Christ as coming the first time as Savior, weren't they? The suffering Savior. Well, let me tell you something. The book of Revelation is the revealing of Jesus Christ coming as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Old Testament believers did not understand the two. They thought that perhaps there was two saviors, one who would be suffering and one who would be king. They just couldn't understand that this would be one and the same savior in two different comings. So in John chapter one, and this is a very, very important passage of scripture, John tells us about the Word, all right? It says, in the beginning, and this could be translated the beginning that has no beginning, because God didn't have a beginning, okay? So, in the beginning, which really wasn't the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This word that I'm speaking to you, to you today belongs to me. Okay, it's my words, you know, and when I speak out of here, that's God's words. We have the word of God spoken in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, 3. We have the word of God living in Jesus Christ, and we have the word of God written in our own language sitting on our laps. And that's amazing. The Word of God is the most precious commodity in the entire universe. What you have in your lap right now is more precious than anything you can name in the entire world. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now you'll notice in chapter 2, or excuse me, in verse 2, he personalizes it. He says he, that would be speaking of the word, was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Okay? So through the word of God all of the universe was created. Everything. And you know, what does that do to the Big Bang Theory, the theory of evolution, etc. Well, it, um, it kind of destroys it because everything was created by Jesus Christ. And you can, re, uh, you can review that. There's another witness to that in the book of Colossians. Okay? It says here, in Him, that would be speaking of in Jesus, in the Word, was life. And the life was the light of men. You know, it says in the book of Revelation in the last couple chapters that we will not need the sun or the moon in heaven to give light. You know why? Because God is light. And Jesus is the light of the world. And we're going to see that His face, which John sees, shines like the brilliance of the sun. 
It says here, this life, that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. You know, it's hard for us to understand why people don't come to the Lord and don't accept the provision of salvation, the pardon of sins. It's a free gift from God. Jesus Christ paid the price, a very expensive price, His life. And you know what the Bible says? It says, people loved darkness. And they won't come to the light because they love darkness. You know, if you think about that for just a minute, it says that hell will be comprised of the darkest darkness, outer darkness, so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. There will be no light at all. And here it says that God is light, doesn't it? That Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the Bible says. And in hell, there will be no fellowship with God for eternity. Eternity. How serious is that? I mean, that's amazing. It says that people will gnash their teeth and they will cry out and scream. And I don't know about you, but... That just doesn't sound like a very pleasant place to me. So, the good news is, is that through Jesus Christ, okay, through His provision and pardon on the cross, through His life, through His death, His resurrection, which gives us hope, His ascension, which gives us a picture, His intercession, which gives us access to the throne of grace, we know because we've accepted Jesus Christ in our life as Savior, we know where we're going. We know what the last page of the book says. We're going to heaven, folks. We have the hope of heaven. Now, let me ask you this. How important is that? I mean, how really, really important is that? Well, we'll deal with that in a minute. Here it says in, in I'm going to re repeat verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The darkness is actually hostile to the light. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, speaking of Jesus, so that through him all men might believe. You know, there's a teaching, a very famous teacher that says that Jesus Christ only died for those who would believe. Now that's not true. It says in Peter that God is not willing that how many? Anyone. Anyone should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us all to know the truth. He wants us all to be happy, not only in this life, but He wants us to make it through to the next life successfully. And here it says that uh, it says that so through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light, that's John the Baptist. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming in the world. He was in the world. This is kind of sad. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Isn't that amazing? The world does not recognize Jesus Christ as creator. And that's just very sad. I mean, in uh, Romans chapter 1, it says that the creation testifies about the creator. The sunset, the, the flowers, the animals, the bees, the, the ocean, the rivers, the lakes, all of nature, a little baby, it all testifies there is a God, there is a God, there is a God. There's no excuse for mankind to stay in darkness because there is a God, and God has made it plain to them. It says here that... Uh, 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. That's the Jews. But his own did not receive him. So you know what he did? It said, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Bible tells us that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become adopted into the family of God. We become children of God. And I don't mean to be disrespectful here, but the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our brother. Now, I don't know about you, but having a king of kings and a lord of lords as your brother, that's a pretty, pretty neat deal. I mean, I don't think we really realize the value of our, of our salvation. There's so much involved in it. It says here that, uh, uh, yet, verse 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Now this, I love verse 14. This verse is probably one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. Here's what it says. Should be underlined or highlighted or something in your, in your Bible. It says the Word, okay, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Let's go back to verse 1 real quick. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, right? And the Word was God. Now we see in verse 14, the Word, the Word that was God, right? <coughs> became flesh. God became a human being. And He made His dwelling among us. There are cults, there are religions that say that Jesus Christ is not God. He's an angel, or he's a prophet, or he's the Son of God, but he's not God. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. Okay? If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, you have a real problem with your doctrine. Alright? That's a real problem. It couldn't be any plainer in John chapter 1, verse 14. I'm going to repeat it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We, uh, uh, John says, this is a parenthesis, we have seen His glory, eyewitness account, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. So the one and only here is named Jesus Christ. It says full of grace and truth. John, this is John the Baptist, testifies concerning him, Jesus. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Look at verse 16. Love it. From the fullness of his grace. Whose grace? Well, the grace of God is exhibited through Jesus Christ, right? From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Now, let me ask you this. Where does discouragement, depression, disillusionment, worry, anxiety, where does all that fit in that sentence? It doesn't, does it? No. Let me read it to you again. From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, it says that God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies to each one of us. We have a full checkbook. 
God's given us a checkbook that's full of blessing. And you know what he says? Go out and write out checks. Okay? Write out checks to your neighbor. Write out checks to your boss, your employees, your friend, your family, your sons, your daughters, your parents, your aunts, your uncles. Write out checks of salvation to each one of these people. And you know what most Christians do? They put the checkbook in their pocket. Isn't that sad? It's just sad. We shouldn't do that. We've got an unlimited checking account of blessings. Let's go share them. Every single chair in this auditorium should be full. Should be full. Why? We're teaching the Word of God, aren't we? We're a pretty friendly church, right? Okay, we got that down. We have snacks. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? And yet we've got seats that are empty. Well, people could say, well, that's the pastor's fault. Nope. Pastor's fault. Well, I'm one guy. Maybe I can go out and talk to ten people in a day, right? And if one of them accepted the Lord or came to church, I would consider that a victory. Yeah. But here we have about 80 people in here. What happens if 80 people go out in a day and speak to one person? Now we've got 80 people spoken to. Let's just say 1% of them respond. That's 8 people. How long would it take to fill up these pews? Not very long. Probably a couple months they'd be all full. I'm encouraging you to go out as we see the time getting short and talk to your neighbor. Talk to your grandchildren. Talk to your children. Talk to your people at work. Talk to anyone who will listen to you. Okay? And you know what? If they don't want to hear it, don't shove it down their throat. This is too valuable of what we've got to shove down somebody's throat. If they don't want it, you know what? Plant a seed if you can. God will bring someone else along to water the seed, and only God can give the growth, right? Okay, well, let's finish up here. It says, from the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only. Now, who did we just reference in verse 14 as being the one and only? Jesus Christ. Now we see in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. Okay, we, could, we know about that. But God, the one and only, that's Jesus Christ. This is testifying to us that Jesus Christ is God. He is God come in the flesh. It says here, who is at the Father's side has made him known. Jesus Christ has made God known. Go back to Revelation, if you would. Revelation chapter 1. We'll just read through what we read through last week so you can get the idea. And remember... You're getting a blessing, okay? You're getting a blessing from hearing this. You can go out to your neighbor and say, hey, you want a blessing? Come to church next Sunday because Steve's going to talk about the book of Revelation and it's guaranteed that you're going to get a blessing. Now, if that doesn't draw them, I don't know what will. <laughs> it says, to the seven churches, this is verse uh, 4, John, so this is the greetings, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, that's the modern day nation of Turkey today. Grace and peace to you from him who is, that's present tense, who was, that's past tense, and who is to come, that's future tense, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Now people would say, oh my, see, the book of Revelation, seven spirits, I don't understand. Well, go to Isaiah chapter 11, and it will tell you about the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. Don't go to it now. I mean, we went to it last week. If you didn't get here last week, you have to go to it when you're home. Okay? But it's wisdom, deity, counsel, discretion, understanding, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Those are just some of them. I don't know if I hit them all, but those are definitely some of them. So it says here, 
It says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. We're going to see that in Revelation chapter 4. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. He was the firstborn, first one to rise from the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. On the way here, I don't know why. I, my imagination goes kind of wild sometimes. But I was thinking about this scripture, the kings of the earth. And I was thinking, you know, now uh, Charles is called the king of England, right? If you know anything about Charles, he's kind of a goofball. But anyway, uh, he's the king of England. What does he do? What did the queen do? They didn't do anything. And yet, he is in this powerful position as king of England. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah, he's the king. He's the real king. Well, it says here, to him who loves us and has freed us, that's past tense, by the way, from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the people of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. Jesus is speaking here in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That means the beginning and the end. Says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Isn't that just powerful? Now let's go to, this is where we left off last week. So, you know, we, we could probably finish this up by about 2. <laughs> verse 9. I, John... Your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. You know, no one said that this Christian life is easy. In fact, life, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, is just not easy. One of my favorite sayings to God, fortunately he has a sense of humor, okay, is... Why can't anything go right the first time? Does anybody else ever say that? Why can't things just go right? I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God. So this is a rocky outcropping 55 miles west of where Ephesus was, okay, in the nation of Turkey, and John was put there by the Roman government because he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus, and they were persecuting Christian believers. That's what happened. In fact, he even tells us, he says, and the testimony of Jesus, so that's why he was there. On the Lord's day, now, this probably means a Sunday, all right, but it could refer to something else, but I think it refers to Sunday. So on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. So John's in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he's probably just having a good fellowship with the Lord and, and just, you know, kind of relax. I mean, don't we all try to relax on Sundays, you know, just relax and then against his rocky outcropping. And it says this, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet. Now, not like a saxophone, not like a, fruit, a flute, no, a trumpet. Now, if you've ever heard a trumpet, a trumpet can be pretty, you know, things are announced by trumpets, right? Okay? So this has got to be kind of a deep and a, a very forceful voice that he hears. And it says, I heard behind me a vo loud voice like a trumpet, which said... Write on a scroll what you see, eyewitness account, and send it to the seven churches, these are all in Turkey, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 
I wish that I could have been a lizard on a rock on this next verse, okay? Look at this next verse. I, that would be John, turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now we're going to see the definition of what this is in just a couple minutes. I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, speaking about the humanity of Jesus Christ. He was dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. That's what a priest wears. And with a golden sash around his chest, that signifies deity. His head and hair were white like wool, signifying purity. As white, uh, excuse me, uh, white as wool, where am I? White as wool. As white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. I don't know about you, but if I'm camping, right, and I hear this voice behind me that sounds like a trumpet, and I turn around, and there's someone standing there with seven stars in his right hand, and among seven golden lampstands, and his face is shining as bright as the sun, and he's got a golden sash around his chest and his hair, and his head are as white as snow and wool. I'm like... <laughs> and that's exactly what happened to John. He's... I can't handle it. Just can't handle it. Let's go on. It says this. It says, His head and hair, verse 14, were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Now one thing about fire is like a campfire. Oh man, it's just so warm and inviting and, and we sit around the campfire and we just relax and you know have a have a, a meal or something something refreshing and it's just wonderful. And yet that same fire can cause a great forest fire that burns thousands and thousands of acres like the fire that's burning up there by the coast. It says here, we're not finished. No, the description description's not finished. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Red hot. That speaks of judgment. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. If you've ever camped by a, uh, by a, a series of rapids or a waterfall, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What, go to Niagara Falls or go up here to Prospect to one of those falls, Mill Creek or something. And man, when water, when water gets to go, and it's loud, isn't it? Very authoritative. It says here, his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a double, a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Whew. Let me read something to you out of Hebrews chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but it's about the Word of God. Listen to what it says here. Because this goes right along with what John saw and heard. It says, For the Word of God is living. It's alive. It's alive right on our laps. It's alive in Jesus Christ. The Word of God is living and it's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. Now it tells us what it's able to do. It's sharper than any doctor's scalpel. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. That's pretty sharp. Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation, do you have that now? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we must give account. Now the Christian is going to give account at the Bema seat of Jesus Christ. That's where 
rewards are going to be handed out. In Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about it. And it says this. It says that the fire will determine the value of the rewards. If our works are gold, silver, and precious stones, they'll, they'll stay. They'll, the fire will not burn them up. But if there wood stay in wood, straw, wood, hay, and stubble, wood, hay, and straw, they'll be, born, they'll be burned up. And you know, I, I wonder, this is just my opinion, but I wonder, when we get in front of the beam of seat of Jesus Christ and we see Him you, in His glory, I mean, just as John described Him here in chapter 1, that's how we're going to see Jesus Christ, in His glory. And those eyes, are they going to be in eyes, are they going to be the eyes that, that see gold, silver, and precious stones, or are they going to be the eyes that burn up the wood, hay, and stubble? I just wonder about that. I know that there's not going to be any suffering, pain, death, or unhappiness in heaven. And maybe, just maybe, this is again me, maybe this is where God wipes away all the tears. Because, you know, when you come before God and you realize the magnitude of Jesus Christ, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And then you realize, oh my gosh, I, I probably could have been a lot better Christian. You know what I mean? You wonder whether that's going to be where God wipes away the tears from our eyes. You know, some people are going to be happy being a janitor in heaven. And they're, they're going to be happy. But, you know, it's all about this earth. Our life on this earth is about building the capacity. Listen to me. It's about building the capacity to enjoy heaven. Now, when I was a kid, like uh, probably starting around age seven or eight, oh, man, I fell in love with cars. Okay? Just love the cars. And so I built model cars and... I went to car shows and, and just really loved cars. But it wasn't until I was old enough to drive and own a car that I really developed the capacity to enjoy a car, right? And in this life, the more we learn about Jesus Christ, the more we get into our system, the attributes of God, Faithfulness and grace and mercy, His power, His love, His righteousness and justice, His holiness and His purity. The more we get to that and grow in Him, I'm telling you this, the more we will have the capacity to enjoy heaven. Why do I say that? The Word of God lasts forever and ever and ever. So, you know, it's said... It said that he who dies with the to most toys wins. Okay? But he who dies with the most toys still dies. And what you have in you, okay, what you have in you, the Word of God that you have in you when you die, you're going to take that with you. That's going with you. The Word of God never fails. The Word of God goes. It's, it, it's never extinct. So, we see here then in Revelation chapter 1, and we'll... Oh, we still got an hour and a half. Well, uh, Revelation... You're not laughing. <laughs> we'll be finished here right now. I thought I was going to get into chapter 2. Oh, silly me. <laughs> it says here in verse... Um, I'm going to read verse 16 over again. In his right hand he held seven stars. We'll find out what that is. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John flat out fainted. He just fainted. 
Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. We're going to study that as we get especially into Revelation chapter 9 when uh, he, the angel is given the keys to the abyss, the bottomless pit, and he opens it and the demonic uh, fallen angels come out. One thing you can't say about Revelation is this definitely interesting, huh? Yes. It says here, so God says this, Jesus says this to, to John. Verse 19 is the entire outline of the book of uh, Revelation, okay? He says, write therefore what you have seen. What did, God, what did John see? Well, he just saw Jesus Christ, didn't he? Revealed in his glory. What is now what is now is the church age. John lived in the church age. Revelation chapter 1 is what he sees. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 uh, is the seven letters to the church. That's the church age. And we're going to explore that next, start exploring it next week if the Lord will come on Saturday. It says this, Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, that's the church age, and what will take place later. Now, Jesus explains the seven lampstands and the seven stars. He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That's the word angelos, and it means messenger. Okay? And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's the mystery. So he's standing among the seven churches. What does the number seven indicate to us in the Bible? Completion and perfection, huh? So when we see him standing among the seven lampstands, he's standing among the complete age of the church. Okay? From the resurrection, from Pentecost, all the way to the rapture. That's the, that's the age of the church, okay? And so he says, the mystery of the lampstands was that they are the seven churches. Well, does a lampstand give light in and of itself? No. It's got to have some oil in it or a candle on it or something, right? So the churches, okay, as the lampstands, do not give out the light unless the Holy Spirit is in that particular group of people. And I'm telling you, we have the opportunity in this church right here to influence the 7,000 people that live in Eagle Point, the people that live in White City, Sam's Valley, even Trail, Shady Cove, as far as Central Point. We have the ability to reach those people. We have the ability to fill every single ch chair in this, in this uh, auditorium. The question is, will we do it? We. Okay? Well, let me continue on. So it says here that the seven uh, stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches. So there is some debate by commentators does this mean actual angels, okay? Or are the messengers the pastors? Well, we know for sure, at least in this case, in Butte Creek Baptist case, that the pastor isn't an angel, okay? So we can, we can definitely, you know, decipher that. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> So in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, what did we learn? Well, we learned about the Word of God. We learned about the blessing that's associated with reading, hearing, and doing this particular Word. We learned about the glorified Jesus Christ and how magnificent He is going to be. And in chapter 2, starting next week, 
we will start with the seven churches. I don't know how far we'll get. The good thing about teaching a book like this is it doesn't make any difference how far we get. Okay? If I get through three verses, I get through three verses. If I get through five, I get through five. What's important is that we leave here understanding what this book, this fabulous book, says to us, okay? So that we can take it into our lives and we can actually live it, as verse 3 says. So pray with me, would you? Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father in heaven please, forgive please forgive me for my sins. Give me a hunger for your word. Give me boldness to, pro to, uh, to profess your word. And Lord God, please bless it in me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you enjoying the study? Yes. Okay, good. Because I'm only charging $4.95 per head. You were off by four cents, yes. Amen. If you're here today and you need prayer for anything, the altar is open at the end of the service. And uh, we're going to stand and sing and praise Jesus' name as we leave. But uh, if you have prayer, if you need prayer for anything, or if you just have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you want to and you want someone to lead you through that, uh, feel free to come down uh, as everybody else is leaving. You can just work your way through. And uh, let's sing that. Uh, Lord, listen to your children pray. Okay. You want to do that? Let's sure. sing that out. It goes like this. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Something's gonna happen. The Lord's gonna take control. When the Spirit of the Lord kneels down to pray, whatever. Oh, don't move mountains. He's gonna save our souls. When the children of the Lord kneel down, kneel down to pray. Oh Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your Spirit in this place. Sunday, okay, and come visit Wednesday night, and we'll uh, we'll discuss some more good stuff.